three, two, one. Voice with Julia, change your voice, change your life. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Voice with Julia's Technique Talks where we demystify conversations surrounding vocal technique with behind the scenes access to great singers of today. I'm your host, Julia Radosh, and with me here today is Gabe Pricer. Thank you so much for being here, Gabe. Of course, hey everybody, and an honor, honor to be here. Good to see you. <laughs> yeah, you too, you too. So, Grammy Award winning baritone Gabe Pricer has been praised oh for his handsome voice <laughs> you didn't know you were getting this did you You got the wrong guy you got the wrong guy <laughs> <laughs> his charismatic energy and timbral allure Ooh, wow they, they made those words up those words you you words wrote up. these didn't you write these now <laughs> actually Opera News wrote those just in case you All were right. wondering I was having a good day I was having a good day <laughs> He has performed with companies such as Minnesota Opera, Cincinnati Opera, Opera Philadelphia, Michigan Opera Theater, Utah Festival Opera, Opera Tampa, St. Petersburg Opera, Opera Naples, Gulf Shore Opera, Colorado Symphony, Jacksonville Symphony, and Atlanta Ballet. That seems like we could make that a Gilbert and Sullivan song right there. Just right there. <laughs> it's a patter song. Yeah. I didn't even know that many companies existed, so. <laughs> I'm learning all sorts of things just reading my bio with you. <laughs> <laughs> His resume includes over 40 operatic and musical theater roles, including Danilo in The Merry Widow, Billy Bigelow in Carousel, Figaro in The Barber of Seville, Dandini in Cenorentola, Escamillo in Carmen, Belcore in Le Lesir d'Amore, Le Mari in Le Mamelles de Tiresias, Albert in Berter, Mercutio in Romeo e Juliette, Tommy in Brigadoon, Silvio in Pagliacci, Harold Hill in The Music Man, Bob Baker in Wonderful Town, and the title role in Aldridge's Elmer Gantry, to name a few. Wow, that's a lot. I've forgotten half of those roles, though, by now. I don't remember. <laughs> Your what, French not is ready excellent, to go? by the way, Julia. <laughs> Your French is excellent. Oh, <laughs> merci. <laughs> De rien. Gabe has made a name for himself as a versatile crossover performer and has especially been active in new works. He created the role of Lieutenant Gordon in Kevin Putz's Pulitzer Prize winning Silent Night at Minnesota Opera with subsequent performances at Opera Philadelphia, Cincinnati Opera, and Michigan Opera Theater. His performance with Minnesota Opera was also broadcast nationally on PBS in 2013 and 2014. He took on the role of Farmer Bean in Tobias Picker's Fantastic Mr. Fox and can be heard on the first official audio recording of Fantastic Mr. Fox under the baton of Gil Rose with the Boston Modern Orchestra Project, which won the Grammy Award for Best New Opera Crazy. Recording in 2020. Hello. Just recently, He's you know, I, I never thought I'd win a Grammy for playing Farmer Bean of all the other characters you listed. <laughs> Farmer Bean, that's the one that wins. Who knew? I bet your kids love that one, though. <laughs> they do. They actually do enjoy. It. Uh, oddly enough, they enjoy listening to the Fox more than Farmer Bean, but <laughs> you can't you have know. it all. <laughs> <laughs> A 2016 League of American Orchestras Emerging Artist, Pricer is known for his dynamic interpretation of Orff's Carmina Burana. Well, I'd want to see that. Other that. concert repertoire includes Bach's St. Matthew Passion, William Walton's Belshazzar's Feast, Bach St. John's Passion and Handel's Messiah. He was a district winner in the Metropolitan Opera National Council competition and won the American finals of the International Lyrico Concorso competition. Mr. Prizer, ooh, I, I sh should have changed that one to Gabe, but okay. Uh, Mr. Prizer, oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> was a resident artist at Minnesota Opera, Kentucky Opera, Pensacola Opera, and an apprentice artist at Des Moines Metro Opera. Wow. Yeah. Outside of his performance career, Mr. Pricer serves as executive director for Opera Orlando. And I left That's that one fancy. in. That's a fancy <laughs> title. They keep up making up these titles. That's so nice of them. <laughs> and just in case you guys are out there, Gabe and I actually grew up in the same hometown in Orlando. 
not yeah. too far from each other. We didn't know each other back Crazy. then. Yeah, we did. It turns out Orlando is a pretty big city. We did not know each other. I know, I know. But I'm so glad that he resurrected the opera company that I saw my first opera at. So, what was very... your first opera? I'm curious. I, yeah. I never asked. Yeah, you want to know? It was really crazy because my first opera that I ever saw was Tales of Hoffman with Guess Who was playing all four heroines? Uh, Brenda Harris. Yeah, you would be I, correct. Yeah, I've seen a video of that production because we just did Tales of Hoffman a couple of uh, seasons back and Brenda's amazing in that role. Yeah. I would not have imagined her as an Olympia, uh, but gosh, she can sing the crap out of anything. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So uh, you managed to do all of this with a family as well and that's <laughs> I have a very uh, amazing wife. I think she gets all of the credit there. There's no question. <laughs> put up with so, my crazy, yeah. So I am wondering because you, you know, you do so much, and technique must be a very important topic for you, because mm -hmm. if you're this busy and you're always gigging, you've got to stay on top of everything. So, you do. You do. yeah, yeah, exactly. So I'd love to chat and hear how you get this wonderful, uh, the wonderful tambral allure to happen all day, every day. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I, I, was, I, I really do think I was just having a good day. Um, technique was, uh, did not come overnight for sure. You know, I mean, all of us have uh, the gift of singing, you know, and that, that's something, uh, a God-given talent, to, to, you know, whatever you want to believe in that. Uh, but as far as getting the skills to, to make it reliable and consistent, uh, that took some time. You know, um, I started singing in high school. Uh, I didn't take voice lessons till college. I uh, had four different teachers in my undergrad. Um, had a wonderful teacher at University of Houston for my master's. I should say I did, I did uh, Florida State University for my undergrad. Had some wonderful teachers there, but always was always just kind of bouncing around for different reasons. Um, had Joey Evans at University of Houston. And then and it was really Braden Harris, who's our mutual teacher and how we met each other, Julia. Uh, Braden really kind of finished me off or put me together one or, one or the other. <laughs> he really gave me the technique that I, I rely on um, every time I warm up and every time I dive into a role. Um, but yeah, I, I think back to my high school days when I was singing Ren McCormick of all roles. You know, I was never really a tenor. I sang tenor in high school just because I could. But I, I'm pretty sure I was always a baritone. Um, and here I am singing Rin McCormick has like high C's, high B's. I'm supposed to be belting. <laughs> just ridiculous. I would lose my voice after every performance my senior year. And luckily I was young enough that I would get my voice back. I could, I could bounce back and I made it through. I don't even know how I fit into those jeans. That's another story. <laughs> but, um, so that's, you know, not having a technique, it can catch up to you. You know, when you're young, you can get away with all sorts of things. Um, mm -hmm. And I was kind of fortunate that I had all those different teachers because I was able to get different perspectives on the voice. Um, mm -hmm. And I had different voice types as well. Um, but I, I was very fortunate when I landed with Braden, who was a fellow baritone, that he could kind of rein everything in um, and really kind of solidify my technique. But by mm -hmm. then I'd been studying voice for gosh, six or eight years. So it really yeah. took a while for me to feel like, hey, I, I actually know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, it does take a while for sure. Um, what was maybe one of, the, one of the biggest struggles when you were growing up and, and training? What was one of your biggest challenges, technique-wise? Well, I, I started off doing music theater, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I got away with doing the high, high belt stuff. And again, I could just kind of muscle and, and do it. I never really knew how to turn over the voice. I, no one really taught me that. I didn't know about head voice per se. I could do loud falsetto and some people thought that was my head voice, but it, it really wasn't. Um, so it took me a while to uh, come to terms with turning over and, and going from chest voice to head voice and really figuring that out. That, that took a while to trust that and to be consistent with it. That was probably my biggest hurdle. And I think it probably is every baritone's biggest hurdle, you know, uh, baritones, we, it's easy for us to muscle and want to hear ourselves and, and we might sound loud in our heads or it might sound like a big mm -hmm. sound. Um, but that's just not a, not a good technique long-term. 
Yeah, no, for sure. Now, can you explain the difference between head voice and falsetto and what a reinforced falsetto might feel like and sound like to you and what yeah. head voice might feel like and sound like? <laughs> well, the way it was ex explained um, you know, from a pedagogical standpoint that uh, falsetto, the vocal cords are not all the way coming together. They're not mm -hmm. uh, abducting and adducting, right? Uh, instead, the vocal cords are just approximating, they're coming next to each other and kind of buzzing, you know, so but they're not all the way vibrating together. So that's why falsetto, uh, well, it means little false one, right? Little false voice, but it sounds a little bit weaker, you know, ah, 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 ah. and I can do loud falsetto, ah, 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 ah. you know, I can make it sound, mm -hmm. sound big, but my vocal cords are not coming all the way together. So if I'm, ah, 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 ah. I then switch from falsetto into full voice, uh, you can hear that little, just a little crack or that, you know, after many years of practicing, I've tried to get rid of the crack, right? But you can hear that little transition from ah, ah, to, to full voice and full voice has a deeper sound, a richer feeling. Uh, you know, the larynx feels a little bit lower. It, it's just a fuller feeling. I mean, it's full voice. It feels fuller. I, I, I don't know any other way to say it really. Yeah. So like, it's like it's anchored to the body. Would you maybe say? Yeah, yeah, that's a yeah. great way to put it. Great way to put it. And then the difference from head voice to chest voice is, you know, that's all about resonance, where you're feeling uh, the resonance. Mm -hmm. Obviously, chest voice, you're going to feel the resonance here. And that's what we talk, you know, we talk in mm -hmm. our chest voice. Uh, most people don't talk in their head voice unless they're Mickey Mouse. Um, <laughs> you know, I do know some people that talk in head voice, that, that's fine. But uh, most of us speak in chest voice. And then, you know, head voice, you're going to feel, you're going to feel the vibrations more in your head. And it's a little bit of, uh, you know, we used to tease in grad schools that tenors, it's, it's not a voice type, it's a disease, right? So singing <laughs> in head voice, it's, um, it's not something you necessarily do naturally. It's an extension, right? You're, you're uh, projecting, you're throwing your voice a little bit, mm -hmm. um, but you're not doing it in falsetto. You're not doing your Miss Doubtfire voice. You're doing it with full, full support, full, um, uh, I, undulation, full closure of the vocal mm -hmm. cord. Okay. Did that make any sense? <laughs> no, it made a lot of sense. I, I want to actually take us back too, because you, you mentioned um, also turning over the voice. So can yeah. you explain in detail? First of all, I want to know what that means, and I want to know how that, how you do it, how how Gabe does it. Oh boy, gosh, I've, no one knows how Gabe does it. <laughs> <laughs> Not even Gabe. <laughs> you know, it, it was important for me, um, obviously I did my undergrad, my master's, and then I continued to stay with Braden. Learning the physicality of the voice, the anatomy mm -hmm. of the voice, was, was really important for me. Um, and <laughs> again, people stereotypes that baritones, you know, they're all nerdy and they know about the sternoclinomastoids, you know, the arytenoids. <laughs> it's, partially, it's partially true, but so when I, when I real, you know, because people throw around that phrase, turn over the voice, right? Turn over the voice is yeah. going to turn. I was like, I don't, I don't feel that. What are you talking about? And then one day in pedagogy class, they actually showed that as the voice goes from chest voice to head voice, the, the larynx, right? Your Adam's apple mm -hmm. actually tilts forward, right? Mm -hmm. So it kind of rocks forward. Yeah. And I was like, oh, maybe that's what they're talking about turning forward. And it does that, right? So it can stretch the vocal cords. Um, because there is no such thing as a high note versus a low note. It's really a, a faster note versus a, a slower note, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the voice box, um, your larynx tilts forward, rocks forward, so it can stretch your vocal cords. They get thinner, and then they can vibrate faster, right? So you can sing mm -hmm. those higher pitches, in other words, for pitches, frequency. So the faster those guys are coming together, the higher your, your pitch, and then the opposite for, for low notes. So that's what I wasn't really allowing to happen. Instead, I was reaching for the high notes and pulling up on everything. That's another kind of fake way to stretch your, <laughs> stretch your vocal cords. Ah! You know, I can do it that way. <laughs> uh, but really, you need to allow that voice box to tilt forward or turn over, right? And trust that if you keep that sighing sensation, that, oh, oh, that you can turn over. And it really kind of does feel like there's a sense of, of, of falling into head voice. And that, that was really hard for me to figure out. I'm gonna mm -hmm. fall into a higher pitch? Like that made no sense. And what was really helpful working with Braden uh, was doing these exercises coming from falsetto 
into head voice or even better doing chest voice really isolated almost like vocal fry like two octaves displaced then mm -hmm. falsetto and then landing in my middle voice or landing in head voice and getting that sensation of ugh, falling into it instead of reaching for it I, uh, I think so many young baritones male singers have that muscle memory of trying to reach yeah. for a head voice right reaching for those high notes and, and instead we need to fall into it, allow, allow it to happen. Get out of our own mm -hmm. way, really. Yeah, yeah. So are there particular vowels or, um, I, I don't know, images or physical things that you do to help assist that turnover? Yeah, vowels is probably the biggest thing to, to okay. figure out uh, turning over and, and your passaggio. Um, so for me, I think about the vowels as like two families or two spectrums. You have your... Mm -hmm your tongue vowels, your lingual vowels, like E, A, A, uh, and everything in between, I, E. Uh. And then you have your, your lip vowels or your labial vowels, like U, O, O, and that also brings you back to A, uh, right? And everything in between, U, uh, uh, um, U, uh, all those mixed vowels in there too. So on, on both sides, there's kind of this helpful vowel for each, each spectrum. And when you go with your, your tongue vowels, what I found to really help me through my passage was an I vowel, an I placement, okay. feeling that I here. So I could be saying E mm -hmm. with my, mm -hmm. my opening here, my mouth, but my other aperture, my other opening or embouchure, mm -hmm. whatever word we want to use there, <laughs> is, is saying I as I go through my passage. Um, and then on the other spectrum with uh, my O, U, O, A family, mm -hmm. I would use a. Uh, have that sensation of oh uh, because it just helps the throat to to stay open mm -hmm. uh another thing that was really helpful was that image of the hourglass um mm -hmm. and i remember my my master's teacher joey evans he just said well when you get to your passaggio which for me is around e flat e natural he's mm -hmm. like you know you're in an open spot in your chest voice and then as you go through passaggio just go to the next closed vowel mm -hmm. and that really worked for me for a long time um what, what happened, I kind of went too far in that direction and overbalanced, like when I had a, an I would close to E and then it got really kind of too tight. So when I came back to Braden and he gave me the, this idea of kind of the I vowel going through mm -hmm. Passage or the I vowel going through the, um, the other family of vowels, that was really eye-opening for me and, and really helpful. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, we could talk about Passaggio for, for hours, for multiple <laughs> lessons. Because uh, there's, there's lots to figure out. And I think it's also uh, specific to each singer what works. Yeah. You know, not everyone has a, an hourglass approach to our passage of some of the more dramatic voices. It's more like a pyramid. <laughs> you yeah. Know? yeah. Like those spinto voices like Plasto Domingo. It's like, hi. <laughs> Just, yeah. He loves those closed vowels. And that works great for him. I, I'm more on the, the lyric side. Um, so even sometimes, depending on the vowel, like an U vowel, I just stay right on U all the way up and down. Mm -hmm. and there's no... There's no hourglass at all, you know. So it just kind of yeah. depends on the voice and, and the person. Yeah. yeah, and and do you find that tongue position plays a part in when you're turning over? Does that have any effect on anything? If the tongue is in the wrong position, yes. Right. <laughs> yeah. And that that was an issue early on for me. Uh, tongue tongue position. You know, ideally the tongue should be resting on those bottom teeth. The back of the tongue should just be kind of out of the picture. Obviously, with certain vowels like eh, the back of the tongue is going to creep mm -hmm. up, or a, e, the mm -hmm. back of the tongue is going to come up. Um, but you just want to make sure your tongue is not tight. You want to make sure it's not sucking back. Um, mm -hmm. And just e eventually, I was able to get to the point where I wasn't thinking about my tongue. I know that's a scary thing to think about, right? Could I ever not be thinking about my tongue? But yeah, you eventually just get to the point where I'm like, I'm just going to rest it on that bottom teeth. Just gonna mm -hmm. stay there. Um, I remember doing exercises. My teachers would put Tic Tacs on my tongue, and uh -huh. I would sing an entire aria or an entire lesson with those Tic Tacs. Wow! It was, by the end of it, the Tic Tac tasted disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it really helped me to just get my tongue out of the way. You know, yeah. every every part of our body like wants to help us sing. <laughs> the more I study, the more I realize I don't need anything. I just need yeah. breath and good vocal posture. You know, get my tongue yeah. out of the way, my jaw out of the way, my eyebrows. <laughs> all, these, all these things want to help create yeah. the sound, you know. It's like, oh, let it go, let it go. Get out of your own way. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, okay, so actually I want to go on something you just said. You talked about the breath. 
So let's go in there. How do you think of breath? Uh, how, what kinds of techniques, what kind of exercises did you do, if you can remember, that you did yeah. to build up your breath system? You can never do too much in terms mm -hmm. of working on breath and talking about breath. You know, uh, when we sing, we are breathing. You know, breathing is singing. Singing is breathing. It's what it's, it's, what it's all about. Um, I think the, the big thing for me, um, I know there are some teachers that have that kind of up and in approach. Mm -hmm. I, I'm very much the appoggio, you know, the old school Italian, down and out, leaning mm -hmm. on those lower abs, um, and also making sure that we, we realize the diaphragm does go all the way around 360 degrees. That's, that's the muscle right under our, our lungs, right? So our lungs mm -hmm. fill up with air, this arch-shaped muscle, the diaphragm flattens out, pushes everything down, right? And that should be happening all the way around. So I remember, I remember doing a lot of exercise with my hands on my back or even being bent over, even doing some yoga poses. Um, I can't remember the names of them now. <laughs> out of, I, been doing yoga. I should be doing more yoga during this quarantine. I need to get back to that. <laughs> um, but doing different yoga poses so you could feel that expansion in your floating ribs and all the way around in your back. Um, so you, you're really taking a deep inhalation. That's, that's the first step, right? Is mm -hmm. getting the right, the proper inhalation. And then the, the onset, instead of feeling, oh, you know, the football, oh, I'm going to muscle it and, and everything comes up and in. And I just let that, let that air out instead. Oh, getting this kind of foundation, this shelf all mm -hmm. the way around and keeping it down and out as long as you can. Now, eventually it's going to come back in, right? During your right. exhalation, those muscles are going to come back in, but instead of it being a rapid process and feeling like we're expelling the air, we're controlling the breath flow, right? There's that word breath control. And mm -hmm. to do that, we have that antagonistic, pole, uh, which the Italians called appoggio, right? The abdominals are actually kind of keeping our diaphragm down. So we engage our abs during yeah. the exhalation, during the exhalation. Yeah. Um, so exercises to kind of build that up. I, I used to do a lot of panting exercises. And you should be able to get to a step where you can do that ad nauseum, where you just pant forever. And you get this nice little dance of just in, out, in, out. That's a great exercise to kind of warm up your, your breathing muscles, warm up your abs, fire up that diaphragm. It's also a good exercise to realize the air will naturally come in. We mm -hmm. don't have to work hard to breathe. Mm -hmm. I, I think about my, my two young children, you know, when they were first born, that was probably the best breaths of their life. You know, when we're first born with babies, <laughs> you see these babies crying, they're wailing, and their diaphragm's like, whoa, whoa, all the way up. No, yeah. no clavicular movement at no. all. They're, they're so efficient, these little babies. Um, so again, it's kind of us getting rid of any bad habits, you know, from wearing a backpack all of our lives. Uh, or, terrible, or, yeah. Sitting at a desk, you know. Uh, but getting back to that, that deep inhalation and going back to what I was trying to say, sorry, I go off on tangents a lot. Too long, so. <laughs> um, that breathing is a natural process and it's easy. The air naturally wants to come in. High pressure out here low pressure in here. So if we just open the pathway, the air will naturally come in. We should never feel like we're sucking in air. It should never be a, <gasps> unless we're Brenda Harris doing a dramatic uh, Lady <laughs> Beth breath. That's, you know, there's an exception to every rule. Uh, but for the most part, it's that silent, deep inhalation mm -hmm. and making sure our onset and our exhalation is down and out, not up mm -hmm. and in. And then just letting that reset naturally every time. The abs are gonna slowly come, come up and we release them to go again. And you, you practice it over and over um, where you don't even have to think about it and just know it's, know it's there. I'll also say that yoga was very helpful. I did, I did a year of yoga when I was okay. at Minnesota Opera and that really just strengthened my core, made yeah. me more aware of my, my torso area. I was like, I, yeah. you start to ache and parts of, I didn't even know I had a muscle there. You know? right. What is exactly. that? Oh, it's terrible. <laughs> um, so I highly recommend yoga for any, any singer, anybody, not even singers. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. So uh, coupling on that, um, do you have any additional thoughts on body alignment? Oh, when gosh, yeah. Posture is huge. Um, mm -hmm. I, I did some Alexander Technique workshops early on. Um, that stuff's very helpful. Um, mm -hmm. It, it, it's crucial. It's crucial. I'll tell you though, 
at a certain point, you're going to get on stage and you're going to be a character, mm -hmm. right? Um, so you want to you want to get that posture to be such a part of you that you can then play with it and, mm -hmm. and know when your character might be in a different position or you might be sitting down, you might be laying down, you might be dying on stage mm -hmm. and, and being aware of how can I still get a low breath? How can I still find a way to find proper posture, proper mm -hmm. breath support? Uh, uh, so I've, I found that kind of more fascinating. Mm -hmm. You know, the academic and voice lessons, we can all have perfect posture and voice lessons. We can all achieve that. But then how do we translate that? How do we make that mm -hmm. applicable uh, to, to real, our stagecraft, to do yeah. the role on stage? Yeah. So what are some of your non-negotiables in terms of posture and alignment when creating characters? Oh, well, what so, are some I'm of the a, things you have to really think? I'm a baritone, so, you know, I'll do anything. <laughs> <laughs> Hang me upside down. I'll take the gig, sweetheart. Give me, you know, anything you need. No, um, I never, I've never felt really compromised. Um, okay. I've had to do a lot of crawling on the floor. It, I've, I've had to do a lot of physicality stuff, especially with Figaro, whether Marriage of Figaro or Barbara Seville. I feel like I'm always uh -huh. just running around. And um, usually what it comes back to is pacing my breaths, not trying to breathe too much, still singing mm -hmm. long phrases, even though I feel like I might be running out of breath. Because if, if I don't do that, if I sing short phrases and I breathe every four bars or two bars, I start to stack the air yes. and I'm not getting that low inhalation. So, so that's mm -hmm. kind of fascinating to work around that. And then also sometimes you have to be like, uh, well, I'm now 36. I, I'm not in my twenties and I can't really lift and throw sopranos around the way that I used to. <laughs> and that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> it's probably better for the sopranos. They probably feel safe. <laughs> that way. So I guess what I what I also want to know is, are there specific alignment things that you specifically have figured out work for you that you have to maybe not think about consciously anymore, but maybe that you did have to think about consciously? Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Back when I was first starting out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Getting, getting the chest. I mean, what was eye-opening for me was the thought of your chest or your shoulders should feel like they're behind your chest. Mm -hmm. Everyone talks about noble posture. And I was like, mm -hmm. okay, noble posture, right? I can feel proud and everything. But until I really felt like, oh yeah, my shoulders are behind my chest. Mm -hmm. And that's one of my like favorite things to do. It's just a shoulder. Yeah. Just it's almost like, like in yoga, know. right? Yeah. Like Yeah, exactly. I know it sounds mm -hmm. so simple, um, but it's really great even like doing uh, bridge poses or cat and cow poses and yoga kind of just helps reset that alignment that your, your back, your spine should have a curve to it. <laughs> Embrace the curve, right? Yeah. The curve is a good thing. Um, so feeling that, and then of course, you know, the crown of the head, uh, this part, right? Being at its highest point, never this. Uh, I had a tendency to look down a lot uh, just mm -hmm. trying to find that balance, getting getting this level right here. Um, mm -hmm. I'm trying to think of little things. You know, I had some great high school chorus teachers, so they they really slapped mm -hmm. me around when I was young <laughs> 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 to fix my posture. But for some reason, I'll never forget. Oh, and I remember uh, too the the kind of ready with your feet. You know, the mm -hmm. ready posture as opposed to straight across. Maybe it's one foot in front of the other, kind of yeah. like you're a boxer. Um, Remember when I was at Des Moines, we were doing a stage combat, mm -hmm. you know, with these broad swords and that really helped me get grounded. And I was like, I'm going to try this when I'm singing, having one foot in front of the other, like you're either ready to give a blow, you know, like a boxer kind of position. You're ready to yeah. give a punch or receive a punch. Um, and that you shouldn't be able to just be knocked off your balance. That again, just helped me to settle, get my breath even lower, which is what it all goes back to. You know, you want to line yourself yeah. up so you can, breathe as optimally as possible yeah yeah for sure um okay so thank you because that really that gave us a really good picture about posture really, i had to go into the caverns of my mind knock off some cobwebs to answer that one <laughs> <laughs> hey i i didn't want to you know reveal everything I have to throw you some curveballs <laughs> <laughs> that's, right. that's all right um so so i'd like to talk about now specific to your repertoire all right I'm going to throw you another, another curveball right here. Right. Okay. Every baritone watching wants to know how to sing. What do you think I'm going to ask? Maybe the Largo? 
from both exactly sides. exactly <laughs> okay so can we can we talk about that for a little bit and i want to talk about that on two points okay first of all we got the high notes second of all we got that insane patter okay yeah. at the end yeah yeah so let's let's maybe first talk about articulation and patter and in it you know, within the regards of this piece. Yeah, good luck. That's uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. I mean, you want to keep every all the consonants towards the front, uh, even the vowels towards the front. Um, what do you, you mean know, by that? Yeah, instead of uh, having the L, uh, you know, I'm trying to remember when we get to the patter part. Uh, Abro figuro, bravo, bravissimo, abro figuro, bravo, bravissimo, ate fortuna, ate fortuna, ate fortuna, no me quiera. So it's, you know, bra bravo, 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 right there on the tip of the teeth. Make sure mm -hmm. your R is up, or, or, or don't get anything down here. Ate, uh, ate fortu, ate fortu, ate fortuna. And, and it's sometimes taking out those rolled R's and just flipping them, and being okay, okay. with that. Um, minimalizing the consonants, keeping them quick, crisp, they're barely there. Um, obviously writing the breath. You know, what's funny, what's funny about Largo, and I hesitate to say this. <laughs> I know people are gonna be mad that I say this, but you don't, you don't really sing until uh, the very end of the aria. Mm -hmm. uh, when he gets to the, uh, after, the after the patter, that's when you have your like your first phrase that you can really like sing through and it, it, it's not followed by a rest i don't have to like pop up a high g um yeah. so all the other stuff you just kind of have to figure out what works for you and that's what's fun about the largo it's totally flexible you know maybe you can sing a g with a, an open a vowel Maybe you need to cover it a little bit, you know, maybe it needs to have a little bit of an uh sound up there, you know, whatever mm -hmm. works for you. And you'll hear different recordings, people do different things. Pablo Vieira, he opens up all of his top stuff and that's just how his voice worked. Um, whereas uh, someone like Thomas Allen is a little more modified. Hermann Pry does all sorts of mm -hmm. modified vowels. <laughs> you love him, for, he's like throwing I vowels. He's like, he's like writing an I vowel all the way up and down because that works for him. Um, so I think for me, my coming to terms with that aria was making it my own, making it my own, finding what worked for me, um, making sure that I'm just making pretty sounds, making fun sounds. Doesn't really matter what vowel I'm singing. <laughs> and the same thing with the pattern, you know, and you get, there are options of changing up the words. You might find that different mm -hmm. words work for you. Ate fortuna, ate fortuna, there are different, ways to do that or people do bravo mm -hmm. instead uh, they mix around the words so i hope that helps any young bears yeah. out there that are looking at the aria um <laughs> i just think it's it's so much fun just have fun with it such a great piece yeah yeah for sure um so okay so let's talk about high notes now how okay. do you how do you approach and we we can talk about it in regards to largo or uh, just in general okay yeah. how do you approach your talk um, yeah, I used to approach it heavy and I'm going to be as loud as possible and I'm mm -hmm. going to show them that I have high notes, you know, and, and Braden kind of just slapped me upside the head. Uh, we did these wonderful staccato exercises where he forced mm -hmm. me to make the top note, the smallest note and the quietest note. And he said, acoustically, your voice, the voice works like a harp right? Mm -hmm. If you had a harp inside your face, that would kind of capture that image. So your low notes are going to be the longest bands and they're going to be right in front of your face, right? Mm -hmm. Just your speaking tones right, right there, right mm -hmm. in front of your face. And then the high notes are way back here, they're the tiniest strings, they're way back here. Right, so we would do like ah, 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 And I would start to feel this horizontal approach mm -hmm. to my voice versus a vertical approach. So many singers are locked into that verticality because we read music, right? And on the page, yeah. it's vertical. But the way our instrument works, remember, we went back to that idea of stretching the chords horizontally, right? So to make higher pitches, I'm just vibrating those chords fasterly. That's a word, mm -hmm. fasterly. Uh, and I'm actually stretching them back horizontally. That, that is a real mm -hmm. word. Uh, so if anything, I need to start thinking 
lateral movement this way. So okay. as I, I'm doing like an exercise, like vivo. And I'm actually thinking about singing behind me. Of course, Pavarotti was probably the most famous one that said that. He's like, when I sing the high notes, I sing behind me. I'm shouting yeah. behind me. And you can hear it. He had that wonderful cupo, that, that yeah. kind of covered sound, because uh, he just stayed in his resonating chamber. Um, mm -hmm. so, so finding that ease was, was really important. So, you know, specific to the larva, you know, you that la, 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 la. You know, you want to la, you want to throw that as a la. You want to find yeah. that easy, that kind of dome uh that don't place yeah yeah okay so what what helps you do that do you think about uh, vowels again is that that like specific or it the vowels yeah if, if you go back to that idea of you have one opening or, or or one area of your body to make a vowel shape right here the throat mm -hmm. right where the vocal cords open up and everything and then you have another area here to make a shape right so as yeah. i'm going through that passage i could be thinking of an oh Oh, mm -hmm. space here to kind of keep me grounded and oh, keep me open while saying mm -hmm. ah here. Oh. So I'm saying ah mm -hmm. here while thinking uh back here. I have two okay. different surfaces. And that, that was really helpful for me early on. And so what are the sounds that you hear inside your head when you sing a great high note versus one that you might go, ooh, I could have done that better? What, what are the differences in resonance or just kind of sensation between those yeah. two? You mean the voices in my head? Like you shouldn't have done that. <laughs> They're not gonna hire you back after that now. No. Thank goodness your mom came, so one person will clap for you. Yeah. Oh, you mean oh, you mean sensations? Oh yes. Um, yeah, exactly. You know, that's another thing that took a lot of trust was that it should feel tiny. It should sound mm -hmm. tiny in your head. I remember doing. A, I think Braden called them the pterodactyl. There. And that's how we kind of developed that uh, voce finta or finely produced mm -hmm. almost fake sound up there, mm -hmm. which really helps me finesse um, my head voice. I, I used to only have one dynamic in head voice, which was just mm -hmm. double four ten, you know? Uh, but it's like, now I have options. Now I have options that I'm trusting that, oh, that's a tiny sound. Kind of the old man voice. I know some teachers teach it that way, or, or some teachers teach a voce di strega, witch voice. Mm -hmm. Kind of, it's mm -hmm. kind of all, they're all kind of similar to find that really finely produced onset um, in your head voice. And then you just have to trust. I'm going to feed the air through that. Another thing that was important um, when I first learned about turning over, I always thought it was like a past tense, like it was turned over. I'm covered. I'm turned. Mm -hmm. It's just turned. And again, Braden set me right where it's like, no, you're, you're turning over. It's a, in the present tense, right? It's mm -hmm. never a completed action. Because I was locking, I was muscling and, and kind of locking into that. So I was like, oh, we're going to hold it, right? Yeah. As opposed to continuing to feed air through it um, mm -hmm. and allow the voice to continue turning over. So, you know, minor, minor change in verbiage can make a whole world of difference for, for young singers. And it did for me. Yeah, yeah. That's, so when you talk about the present turning over, that prevents you from locking the larynx or locking something else? What? What would you say? Locking the larynx and also locking your, your abs, locking the breath, okay. you know, over compressing the abs. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Okay. Um, now let's, uh, we, we were just talking about high notes. Let's go down here and let's talk about low note. That's when your vocal <laughs> cords vibrate more slowly, slowly. Slowly. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Not more loverly, just slowerly. <laughs> oh, it could be loverly. Yeah, sure. Sure. Um, yeah, the big thing for me with low notes is just keeping them right in front of your face um, and okay. really trusting that it is that uh, speech register and you don't mm -hmm. need to, you don't need to fake it or, you know, I, I sang bass roles in college. Mm -hmm. Again, I just happen to have those notes. Lyric baritones kind of have an upper and a lower extension. Not that I was ever a bass, but here I was doing Kalini, and I was like, I'm going to sound back, yeah, I'm going to sound low. It's supposed to just <laughs> back, yeah, it's imana. Just keep it right in front of you, and that's trust that that will carry more than over compressing the larynx, trying to sound low. Okay. Keep it, keep it in front of you. Let your natural resonance do its thing. So if you depress the larynx, you're going to cut off your low voice. Is that what you're saying? You yeah. Um, 
you're, you're going to cut off your overtones is really yeah. what it is. You're going to cut off what allows your voice to carry over an orchestra, allows your voice to carry acoustically without a microphone, right, mm -hmm. uh, through a large hall. So um, you got to get out of your own way and let the voice do its thing. That's what's so uh, miraculous about it is that overtones even exist and that the voice can cut over an orchestra when it's produced uh, the right way. So, yeah. Yeah. So... Okay, well, that's that's very helpful. I'll go practice my low notes. Yeah, <laughs> I want to hear your low G. I hear your spot of low G. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'll work well, on sopranos, that. Sopranos need low notes too. You know, you can't be afraid of chest voice. True, that's There's true. There's something too about embracing all of your registers, even mm -hmm. vocal cry, embracing whistle tone, uh, falsetto. And then starting to, to mix those registers, that's what really helped me to line up my voice. So it sounded the same top to bottom. Mm -hmm. And Braden was a big help with that. Going back to those like octave displacement exercises, yeah. flipping from vocal fry to falsetto. Back Can to you demonstrate one of those? What, what are those octave displacements? Yeah, it would be something like, mm -hmm. I don't know what pitch I'm on, but uh, like, and hopefully that final note has a little bit of my whistle tone, <laughs> we want to call it whistle tone, and a little bit of my vocal fry. At the very least, it has a reminder, a reference point of how loose and open the, yeah. the vocal fry was and how tiny and finite the, the whistle tone was. Yeah. So, so now you use the term whistle tone, and that is not to be confused with falsetto, am I correct? Mm -hmm. Not to be confused with falsetto. Yeah, it's a whole other okay. register. Yeah. Okay. So can I you explain that a little know. bit? I don't know if I have whistle tone. I'm totally teasing. But <laughs> sopranos typically do. Mezzos typically do. Uh, mm -hmm. Mariah Carey had a great whistle tone, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and for, again, you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong. But from my understanding, whistle tone, the chords are not coming all the way together. They kind of pucker, mm -hmm. and they literally whistle. So you're not really hearing yeah. vibration necessarily. Again, you can mix it though yeah. with your head voice. So I don't know. Yeah. You have to educate me on whistle tone, Julia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you got the essence of it. Not, the chords aren't vibrating all the way down the length. That's, that's correct. Absolutely. Okay. But it's, yeah, it's interesting because, you know, we talk about whistle tone so much with, you know, sopranos and, and female singers. So it's curious to hear you say whistle tone and you know it, how it influences your voice as well um so yeah, when you're me, there's singing like this, yeah. there's like this weird thing that happens um in in my voice and I, I know it happens in some other baritone voices like i can do loud falsetto like reinforced falsetto up to mm -hmm. a certain note and then after that all that's left is this really tiny falsetto which in my head is kind of like whistle tone but it's like a whole different register you know so like yeah. I'm, oh I could take that up to right there. But then there's a couple other notes above that. Yeah. You might. So, I, don't I don't know if it's really whistle tone. Who knows what it is? <laughs> I think it is. I actually totally think it is. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you mix that and you can bring that down. Is that correct? You can bring right. that whistle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when I'm, when I'm, when I really haven't sung for a while, I'll do those kind of recalibrating or realigning exercises where I tap into all the registers and try and line them back up. Wow. That's, yeah. that's really cool. That's it's like getting, getting your tires lined up or getting an oil change with your car, right? <laughs> so now how do you, um, how do you approach coloratura or singing fast? I run away. I run away. <laughs> I mean, very fast though. I run very fast. Run no, fast. I actually, I love coloratura actually. Mm -hmm. um, luckily, baritones get away with murder because we don't have to be perfect like you ladies. Um, for me, you can only do coloratura as fast as you can think, right? So what's really helpful in preparing for coloratura is I, I play it on the piano because if okay. I can play it in my fingers, that means that my brain can conceptualize yep. it and, and think about it that quickly. Um, so I find that to be to be very helpful. Um, another thing that's helpful in color tora is not being afraid of changing the vowel as you go. Mm -hmm. uh, this was something that Bre or Brenda, I think, actually taught me this in one of her master classes, Brenda Harris. Like if I have a whole, you know, I'm doing a handle aria or, or a, a Bach aria and it's on mm -hmm. off for like five pages. 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, to go between ah uh and uh every mm -hmm. note, because that again just kind of frees up your voice. You don't get into yeah. that locked machine gun color tour approach, but ah. Uh, Saying it, so I'm in my head, I'm thinking I'm going back and forth, or with A, I'd go to it, A, so I'm thinking A, 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 A in my head. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, you don't even hear that uh, on the outside, you know, it goes by so quickly, people don't register it as, as two different vowels unless they're really listening for it. Um, yeah. And it just keeps you free as a singer. It's also great when you're going through your passaggios because of those, uh, those, those nice little hybrid vowels. So yeah. I'm a golfer now. I got my hybrid club. I'm going to bring up my eval. Um, <laughs> but yeah, th those two things for me are really how I was able to kind of get over color tour. And I don't, I don't find it intimidating at all, to be honest. Yeah. Now, there's sometimes where the conductor's like, no, I want the distempo, you know, and I don't know why it has to be Italian. He could be, and he's like, I want. <laughs> I want the really fast tempo, and I'm like, well, I'm just gonna have to fake it till I make it, you know. And that, <laughs> there, there's the academic side of color tour, then there's the practical application. Like when I was doing Dandini and that generous yeah. finale, I mean, Dandini has like 16 pages in one bar, everyone else has like two notes, you know, like 16 notes in one bar, they have two notes in one bar. I'm like, and the tempo is like this, you know, per bar. I'm like, oh, hey, oh, hey. I just hit the first note, last note. First note, last note. I'll see you guys for the bows. Thank you. Thanks for hiring me. <laughs> Hope you have me back. Right. That's awesome. We've all been there. We've all been oh, there. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So now I'd love to ask you about your crossover repertoire because you have so much of it on your resume and in your roles that you yeah. offer and also new American offers. It, a lot that I didn't even read. So I'd love you to talk about contemporary vocal technique a little bit in terms of crossover repertoire and maybe modern American opera, how that might differ slightly in aesthetic for you from, sure. you know, a bel corre or something. Right. Yeah, of course. Um, and it really depends on the composer or even the character. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at some of the music theater repertoire, like Emil in South Pacific was written for an opera singer, written for Ed Sirkinza. Um, even Billy Bigelow can be sung pretty legit. Mm -hmm. um, Harold Hill is almost more like a character voice, but he has moments where it's like legit singing. Uh, I've done some Sondheim where it is, you know, let's hear the straight tone for five hours. Let's, let's do the belting. Um, and, you know, as, as I said, I started off in music theater and then got introduced to opera. And I'm very grateful that I did. because I think if I would have stuck with music theater, I would not have been able to cross over to do opera, mm -hmm. um, but getting the opera training and classical technique has enabled me uh, to cross over to music theater. I'm very grateful for that. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's hard to have a general answer. I'll give you a specific example though, that I think might, might illustrate it. So talking about Billy Bigelow specifically, you know, at the end of um, his big number soliloquy, and he has all those high Fs and he has the high G and then he ends on the F or if you're John Ray, he takes it up to a B flat, which I will do one of these days. I will do it. <laughs> John Ray was amazing. And, and you, it's interesting because he was trained classically. Howard Keel was trained mm -hmm. classically. And a lot of those guys back then, like the 50s, 60s, would cross over. And that, that was more common. It's not as common nowadays, mm -hmm. which is kind of interesting. I digress. So at the end of soliloquy, I mean, it's very machismo, overly passionate. He's like, I'll go out and make it. I mean, he's just, he's just, it's so passionate. It doesn't feel right to like round off the vowel and I'm gonna modify to an O vowel because I'm singing an F natural. So, you know, you take a little cheat, you pull up your chest voice and you belt it a little bit. You know, and that's just, you get the right support. You do it enough times where it's comfortable. You're still kind of mixing that head voice. You know, for me, when I mix head voice into my belt, it's just that kind of feeling of elasticity or stretch. Oh, go, go stretch. Oh, go out and make it or steal it. But then we get to the high G. You're like, oh boy, am I going to belt a high G? That doesn't really work. And it's not, it doesn't really fit Billy Bigelow. You know, he's, he's mm -hmm. kind of a character. So then you have to 
turn it, you turn it, and you, you hook the crap out of it. Or take! You know, you really enjoy the hook. It's great. <laughs> Hooking's great. Highly recommend it. And then you have that final F where you hold it for 50 bars. And it's like, if you're going to hold it, it's ironically, for me, it's easier to hold a belt. It's hold, easier to hold straight tone than to hold like legit in Passaggio singing. So like, I'm going to take another cheat. I'm going to belt this. Or And then he mix in the vibrato at the end. And people are like, oh, oh like, he's a classical musician and he did straight tone. Oh my gosh, tell me, did you hear that? That's amazing. So I got a thunderstorm brewing behind me. I don't know if you can hear the thunder. Oh, um, yeah. But yeah, so I mean, that's a very specific answer to your question. It, it all depends. It all depends on the context of the song, the character, the show. Uh, but what you, want to, you want to be able to bring a bag of tools, your toolkit, to any role and be able to have that role come to life. Um, and having a solid technique, first and foremost, creating a toolkit, first and foremost, will enable you to do that. That's, that's awesome. Can you just describe uh, for all of us and maybe for us sopranos that have no clue what hooking actually feels like? <laughs> yeah, well, that's not true. I know mezzos that hook like the best of them. <laughs> I mean, it, for you, it's kind of like scooping, except with uh, a little more thrust and uh, a little more weight. It's, it's basically a way to kind of throw your weight into your head voice. A high, a high, a high, and it almost always ends on a closed valve. <laughs> Just because that's kind of satisfying. Uh, hooking is a, um, a sloppy way of letting the voice turn over, right? Okay, okay. <laughs> so, so not advisable in most repertoire. You know, there's the academic side, and then there's the real life side. I gotta say, Cheryl Mills made a great career out of hooking. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, Carmina Burana, there's some great hooking moments in that. I mean, there are there are times for it. There are times for it. There's also times for that. <gasps> you know, dramatic inhalation. There's times for character yeah. voices, time for nasality. Right. There's times for all sorts of wrong things. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. That's awesome. So what was your most challenging crossover role for you? Oh gosh. Um, yeah. When I was doing, I think it was man number two and <laughs> uh, putting it together, the Stephen Sondheim review. And, you know, we do a, a wide range of, of his songs in that. And one of them was marry me a little. Mm -hmm. And uh, it has all these, uh, I'm ready, I'm ready now. And like it goes all the way up to an A flat and you're just, you're just holding it, I'm ready. I'm not going to do it right now for you. But um, getting, getting comfortable with that uh, definitely, definitely took some, and finding the right balance because I didn't want it to sound too classical. You know, mm -hmm. I wanted to respect the, the style of Sondheim. But be true to my voice, be healthy with my voice. So, uh, so yeah, that that was kind of fun. And by the end of it, um, it just it just was fun, you know. Again, to kind of feel like I'm breaking every rule in the uh, classical <laughs> classical voice book. I'm gonna pull my chest voice all the way up to an A flat, and uh, <laughs> so that, that was a little tricky to figure out, but it, it it got there. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. All right. So. I'm asking everybody this question. It's like our last specialty question. Okay. What okay. is your desert island vocalist? If you can only pick one vocalist to get you ready uh, to sing for the rest of your life, what is it? Well, I know most baritones vocalists is <clears throat> and then they're ready to go. So I'm not going to pick that <laughs> one. Um, I typically will do uh, one staccato exercise and then one legato exercise. If, I, if my voice is in shape, and I've been singing a while just to, uh, you know, right before I go on. So I would probably do a combination, uh, maybe something like, uh, Long extended exercise, yeah. I don't even know if you can hear me. It's like hailing outside. I know. I oh just gosh. started hearing that. It really is hailing. It is hailing. In Florida. Florida. Hailing that doesn't in Florida. happen too often. No, not in like the end of May, too. 
Right, right. That's crazy. We need the rain, so hopefully the ice will melt. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, Gabe, thank you so much for coming and talking to me today. Oh, it was a pleasure. This is lots of fun. We should do I it. know. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And I think everyone's going to find this very entertaining and helpful, which is great. And I hope so. I hope so. And send your audition tapes to Opera Orlando. We'd love to hear all these young singers. And this is what I wanted to ask you. Yes. Tell us about what's going on at Opera Orlando and what's going on in your season coming up. Yeah, you know, a lot of things have been canceled or postponed, obviously, mm -hmm. because of the pandemic. But uh, fingers crossed that we can be back at it uh, by October. That's when our next production is at Opera Orlando. We're doing Deflator Mouse uh, okay. in October. Uh, and then the other two big, big productions are Hansel and Gretel and Carmen next season. Oh, nice. Our big three. It'll be our fifth anniversary season as Opera Landis. So we're excited about that. Um, for me, uh, the production that was canceled was Pirates of Penzance, and that's been rescheduled. Um, right. And I'm actually doing Modern Major General in that show. <laughs> Very uh, fun. Am I that old now? Um, <laughs> but it really is a fun role. It really is. And that's over at Opera Tampa. Um, I'll be singing in Deflator Mouse here at Opera Orlando. And, Everything else is kind of on hold. I was supposed to do a Sweeney Todd in Montana, and I hope I hope it happens because that's like a dream role. Oh yeah, yeah, that'd be lots of fun. So that's awesome. And where can we find you on the interwebs? Where can we find Opera Orlando? Where can we find Gabe? Sure. Well, you don't want to find me, uh, but if you're just desperate, uh, I do have a website, GabrielPricer.com. Uh, Opera Orlando. Our website is OperaOrlando.org. Uh, we also have a Facebook page that we've been doing weekly live streams from. Uh, also, our YouTube channel has a, a lot of great footage on there. So, Opera Orlando uh, YouTube. Awesome. Cool. Well, yeah. hopefully everybody check it out. Please do. Please do. And thank you so much, Julia, for having me. This was a lot of fun. Well, thanks for coming, Gabe. It's awesome. All right. All right. Take care. Stay safe. Be safe out there. <laughs> you, okay. you too. Bye. Bye.